everyone for being here. Scott Moore is a scholar and policymaker focused on environmental issues, especially water issues, climate change, and oceans. His research and commentary on these issues has appeared in Nature, Foreign Affairs, and the New York Times. His previous work experience includes the U.S. State Department, where he led U.S.-China cooperation on climate change and ocean conservation in the years 2015 to 2016, and the World Bank, where he led water sector institutional reform and financing projects. He holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University and a master's and doctoral degrees from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He currently serves as the director of the Penn Global China Program at the University of Pennsylvania. His first book, Subnational Hydropolitics, Conflict, Cooperation, and Institution Building in Shared River Basin, Moore examines how climate change and other pressures affect the likelihood of conflict over water within states, provinces, and countries. His book uses case studies in the Colorado and Yellow River Basins to examine how climate change will affect subnational hydropolitics. This talk will explore the role that water has played in Chinese politics, its rapid economic growth, and its struggle to make its development sustainable. Also discuss new and old tensions between China and its neighbors over shared water resources, and the role that conflict might play in China's rise. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks to you all for, for coming and for the invitation to, uh, to be here with you today. Uh, this is, in fact, my first trip to Texas, so uh, I'm really pleased to be here, uh, particularly because uh, it's a region that, uh, that is pretty important for uh, one of my major interests, which is looking at water uh, policy and, and politics. Um, the talk that I, I wanted to, uh, uh, to uh, deliver today kind of ties together uh, two strands of my work. Uh, one is on China. Um, so I've uh, primarily uh, worked in the environmental field, but also uh, have at various points in time uh, done some thinking about kind of broader U.S.-China relations, um, China security issues, that type of thing. Um, but then also had this really kind of deep interest in water uh, as a particular uh, uh, type of environmental policy problem. Uh, and for reasons I'll get into in a little bit, um, I think it is a really uh, uniquely kind of complex and often really difficult policy area to, to try to tackle and to try to do well. Uh, and I think that that kind of basic set of challenges uh, applies just as much in Texas uh, as it does in a place like China. But in the, the talk today, I want to really make kind of three points um, that kind of get to the connections between uh, these two strands of, of work, both thinking about China uh, and its changing role in the world, and then thinking about uh, this tremendous problem that we have uh, in most regions around the world um, with water. And the reason that I think that those uh, two things connect well is that, first of all, uh, water is actually really, really significant to Chinese political history. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Concerns over managing water, using water, allocating water were some of the most important issues um, that China's leadership uh, dealt with in the uh, post uh, kind of 1949 period. And it actually informed a lot of how they subsequently built the institutions of governance um, that still uh, govern uh, China. The second thing I want to highlight is that partly because of this legacy, China has adopted some of the more ambitious water policies uh, really in the world today. Um, they're not perfect. They have a lot of drawbacks and disadvantages, which um, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but in terms of ambition, uh, they're probably foremost in the world. And I do think that there are useful things um, that we can take away from the example of China as we think about how to tackle uh, our water challenges here in the US, uh, as well as in other countries around the world. The third and final thing, point I want to make, um, is that the way that China is using its water and the sort of policies and politics that surround that um, is becoming even, even more important because of China's changing role in the world, especially the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which many of you have probably heard about. It's essentially a giant package of infrastructure development projects pretty much uh, across uh, Eurasia, uh, Africa, and parts of Latin America. Uh, and as part of that, China's building a lot of water infrastructure, a lot of dams, things like that. Um, that obviously reflect uh, its own domestic approaches to uh, managing and using water. So even though uh, some of this is going to be focused on sort of China's domestic situation, uh, it's, these issues are confined uh, within China's borders, uh, and that will increasingly be true uh, into the future. 
Um, so just to kind of briefly start with a few things, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about uh, are from a uh, recent book um, published this past summer, uh, uh, Oxford University Press. And basically the, the book um, kind of looks at water conflict. Uh, that's a, something that I've been particularly interested in over the last couple of years. But it tries to look at water conflict um, at the, the subnational level rather than uh, the international level. So I'm really interested in explaining things like uh, uh, the dispute between the Colorado River Basin states and things like that. Uh, and I do, as part of that, look um, at the case of China, because as I'll explain, one of the really interesting uh, kind of aspects of looking at water policy and politics in China is you see a lot of disputes uh, and conflict between provinces and local governments. And in an authoritarian country, that's fairly unusual. Um, and I think that's a really interesting and valuable example for trying to sort of understand uh, how China works politically by being able to look at these tensions um, over water and at the sort of subnational level. Okay, so kind of back up and say, you know, why we're why we're interested in this at all, why we sort of care about these problems. Uh, there is a world water crisis, uh, except that there's not sort of just one single uh, water crisis. There are several kind of going on uh, all at once. Uh, we almost uh, always, or, or almost never, rather, have. Uh, the amount of water uh, that we want in the places that we uh, want it and at the times that we want it. Uh, and moreover, uh, it's usually not in the form uh, that we want it or need it, whether it's uh, sort of locked up in uh, ice shelves or too polluted or degraded to use for the purpose that we want it. Uh, we have a really significant uh, kind of water quality uh, and quantity challenge uh, around the world. This graph kind of shows a couple of manifestations of that. And these are, um, this is about 15 years of observations from a satellite called GRACE. And what this satellite uh, enables uh, us to do is track large scale, or tr track uh, changes in water uh, distribution and availability over really big uh, uh, regional scales. Prior to um, uh, kind of coming online of this satellite, we didn't really have very good ways to look, for example, at how uh, the Antarctic ice sheet uh, was melting at a kind of very large uh, regional level. Uh, it would, all, would have also been very, very difficult for us to see uh, the scale of groundwater depletion uh, in the region of Texas. But thanks to the satellite, we can sort of get a sense of these global uh, changes in the distribution of our water resources. Uh, and while we do see uh, you know, fairly significant large regions of the world where you're getting uh, uh, accumulations of water, that, that's uh, on the blue side of the spectrum. Uh, you'll also obviously notice that there are uh, even more parts of the world uh, that are suffering from uh, significant uh, depletion of water. For one reason or another, by the way, often uh, this is reflective of both kind of climate change effects, but also uh, just sheer groundwater depletion and uh, rising water demand. But suffice to say, uh, we do have a very significant kind of um, uh, interlinked uh, quantity quality challenge with respect to water that, that probably does rise to the level of a crisis. So what does this mean? Well, one of the things that if you're a political scientist uh, in particular that people talk about in meeting uh, is uh, an increased likelihood of conflict, increased incidence of conflict uh, over water. And you can sort of take your pick uh, of eminent people who have said some version of this, uh, maybe one of the most famous uh, is uh, former World Bank Vice President who back in 1995 uh, said something along the lines of the wars of the next century are not going to be fought over oil, they'll be fought over water. And that's a kind of common refrain that you, um, that you hear pretty, uh, pretty frequently. The only problem is the evidence doesn't really bear that out, um, at least if you kind of go back on the historical record that we have. Um, so back in 2010, uh, some researchers tried to look uh, in the period 1948 to 2008 and look at every instance where uh, you had uh, some type of conflict, whether it was political or violent, uh, that involved two countries, and well, at least two countries, and water. Um, pretty broad definition. They came up with about 6,500 of these total events. Less than 30, 27 uh, to be exact, uh, of these instances involved any type of violence whatsoever between countries. And none of those, by the way, were actual wars. So in no case uh, did two countries mobilize their armed forces uh, and actually go to war uh, over an incident involving water. 
Over roughly the same period, though, uh, countries uh, signed about 200 interstate water agreements. So if we just sort of take this at face value, and as I'll say a little bit more later, this is at the end of the story, but if we just sort of take this at face value, a lot of reason to question the idea um, that you'll see uh, inter international uh, or interstate conflict over water uh, as a result of these, uh, these pressures uh, that I mentioned. But that isn't the end of the story, because if we open our kind of lens for what water conflict uh, looks like a little bit, we see that it is in fact pervasive at the subnational level. Um, both between regions like states, provinces, prefectures, different types of political jurisdictions, as well as social groups um, within those jurisdictions. And you can sort of, uh, there isn't good data on this, by the way, but just anecdotally, you can sort of take a walk around the world and point to some obvious uh, examples in most major um, parts of the world. Certainly enough uh, to say that there, this is a, a pervasive phenomenon that affects uh, uh, almost every uh, large country. And that's really what kind of uh, informed my interest in this issue of looking at kind of subnational water um, politics and conflict, including in the case of China. Uh, just to point out, there's this observation by some two, two uh, well-known sort of uh, researchers on this question, uh, that while we don't have any really good examples, at least in modern history, of water wars between countries, um, what we do seem to be finding is there's some type of inverse relationship between the scale that you're looking at, subnational versus international, and how intense or frequent conflict is. Okay, so the, the next kind of piece of this puzzle is that when you, when you look at uh, subnational uh, kind of instances of conflict, particularly interjurisdictional conflict, um, so be again between states, provinces, those types of entities, um, you see a couple cases where uh, you uh, start out with conflict, uh, but that conflict is eventually transformed into cooperation. Colorado River Basin is uh, a pretty good example of that. Um, not perfect, by the way, and right now we're mired in some very contentious negotiations uh, between the states and Colorado. But just by way of some uh, explanation on that point, we go back to 1934, Governor of Arizona mobilizes the National Guard, declares martial law, assembles a fleet of boats, uh, became called the Arizona Navy, uh, all to block construction of a dam uh, that he thought would benefit uh, California um, with respect to uh, the waters of the, of the Colorado River uh, and California being able to divert water from that. It's a pretty pure example of you know, guys with guns uh, on a boat uh, sort of preventing um, water from flowing uh, into a neighboring region. Uh, interesting, by the way, that obviously this is all subnational, but does involve the use of kind of armed force. Um, then you flash forward 80 years, uh, and you get an agreement called Minute 319 uh, that represents uh, an interstate agreement for essentially how to manage uh, the waters of the Colorado on a fairly uh, long-term basis, uh, and provides for uh, some minimum level of stream flow. That's what this, this graph is sort of depicting. Um, into the lower Colorado uh, and its uh, uh, exit into the Gulf of California. That was something that hadn't existed for decades, but is really important for uh, ecosystems in that lower, um, that lower delta. So pretty good example of, uh, uh, of transformation from conflict to cooperation over an 80-year period. Again, not perfect, and we can certainly get into um, some discussions of that. But suffice to say, we do have examples of where you have this transition uh, and transformation of conflict into cooperation at the subnational level. Um, I'm actually going to skip this for sake of time, so we'll get into, um, uh, into the case specifically uh, of China, which shows um, both that kind of uh, uh, importance of looking at the subnational level with water conflict uh, and the importance that those types of conflicts play in the politics of water and in how um, policy is developed over how water is used but also shows um, 